Good morning, good to see everyone. I'm Matt, I'm the pastor here at Eagle Creek. Everyone online, great to have you as well. We are in our series, Truth Be Told. And the goal of this series is to help you as a family to be able to defeat lies that are being told in our culture. They're being told through really every form of media. They're being told in many, many, many classrooms across our nation, um, whether that be grade school, junior high, high school, universities. And they're becoming common beliefs in our culture that are undermining faith. And if we do not see them for what they are, if we don't recognize the lies, if we don't try to parent against these lies, then our own children will fall into these lies. They'll buy them, they will believe them, and it will change the way they view God dramatically. In fact, many, many, many children, even in our own communities, are being converted to atheism from Christianity by the time they leave high school. The reason I know that is because Sherry and I have had to talk with families that are going through that. It's an active work that happens by specific people, and I'll tell you, there's a lot of amazing godly school teachers in our school system, and I'm thankful for our school district. There are others that are bent on converting your children to atheism away from Christianity. They're active, they're aggressive, and they don't let up. I know this because I have kids that have gone through the schools and come home, and I've had to talk them through and help them unlearn a lot of garbage. I'm not saying this secondhand. I'm saying this as the firsthand parent that's had to do the work myself with my own four kids. So what I want to do is I want to equip you and help you to understand these things. So one of the big areas right now one of the areas, each week we're hitting a different area and um, trying to walk you through. Last week was on postmodernism, post which is basically everything's right. You have your truth. I have my truth. There is really no truth. That concept, if you want to hear more about that, listen to last week's message. Today, what we're focusing on is naturalism. Naturalism basically says there's no God, but the universe is all there is. It's all just matter space and time nothing else the laws of nature that govern nature but there it, there's no god there's nothing else and it's a bunch of you know uh crazy religious people that believe stuff like that and they are not reasonable they're not logical they're not science-based how many of you got that feeling from culture you've recognized that that is a lot more people thinking that way about christianity they, they think that you're not too bright. You know, it's like, hey, if you're not like smart and you don't want to study and you don't want to figure things out, go ahead and be a Christian or a religious person. But for all the people who really want to be smart, they'll just believe science. Here's the reality. There are many, many, many Christian scientists who followed the same evidence and found God. And so we're going to take a little bit of time on that today. Um, but I want to walk you through so that you recognize what this is, naturalism, where it comes from, and how it's affecting us and our culture and our kids so that we can protect our kids from this. Um, first, let me start off with God's view of this. In Psalms chapter 14, verses 1 through 3, God says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, any smart ones in the bunch, okay? Any who understand, who seek after God, and they have all turned aside together, they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. Now, in reality, we know that there's truth to this. Jesus had to come and die for the sins of all mankind. But he said there's an even deeper level where people deny my existence the fool says in his heart there is no god and the result of that is what they get to go live however they want to if you deny the existence of god then you can deny that there's any moral absolutes that you have to follow you can deny that there's any judgment that you'll face when you die after this life and therefore you're free to live immorally and it's not really immoral if there's no God setting up morals. You can do whatever you want. He says, people say in their heart there's no God, and then what do they do with that thought process? They get corrupted, 
and immoral and do whatever they want to do. And God says, but I'm still looking for people who understand. I'm still looking for people who try to get it and put the energy and the effort into understanding me. And so God believes that mankind has an underlying motive not to believe in him. And that motive is to have the freedom to live however they want. They just want to write God off and all their obligations to God. And so I'm just going to tell you this. I'm not going to argue with God on that one. I'm going to trust that when God looks at the human heart, he has a pretty good view of an understanding of us. Can I get anyone who agrees with me on that one? I believe that God has a pretty good understanding of this. So let me tell you what you're buying into and what your child is buying into when they buy into naturalism. Here's some things you're going to have to buy. One is they're going to have to sell on, on the existence of God altogether. They'd have to say, if I'm a naturalist, I don't believe there's a God. They'd also have to say, I don't believe that in God's creation of the world and universe, that it happened by natural laws, not by God's order. They would also have to sell out on healing, answer prayers, miracles, basically all the cardboard testimonies you saw up here, not from God is what they would say. Uh, they'd have to say, well, I don't believe there are any angels or in, there are any demons. I don't believe that the human has a soul, and I don't believe there's life after this life. That's what the naturalist ultimately has to believe when they sell out, when they believe that thoroughly. And things like love or hope or joy or purpose or moral values, they're not real things, intangible things gifted to us by the God who created us. no. To the naturalist, they're just chemical responses in the brain. That's it. So purpose isn't real to them. Love isn't real to them. It's just chemical responses that help us to survive as a species. Here's what it sounds like. You're going to hear your kids and your friends and maybe even yourself saying things that sound a lot like a naturalist. And these are the things you'll hear. Some of them, there's a many, many more, but I'll give you a few of them. Um, one of the phrases you'll hear is, well... This is all there is. This is it. This is the world you got. In other words, there's nothing beyond this, no purpose. This is it. This is all there is. Or how about, there's no purpose unless you create it. In other words, you weren't created for a purpose by God. There's no purpose unless you make up something to live for. You got to come up with something because no one else is going to come up with anything for you that rules out God. How about the circle of life? The circle of life. Uh, remember the, what was that, the Lion King? And it sounded so noble and wonderful, but ultimately it just means you're the fertilizer of life. You just die and something else uses your particles. The fertilizer of life. Doesn't that feel just, your, wow, that's amazing. Okay, how about uh, this one? Survival of the fittest. Now, we use that kind of like uh, we can just, you know, dog eat dog world. That's the way it works. Survival of the fittest. I beat you out. I tear you down. I get what I want. You don't get what you That's the way the world works, you know. Survival of the fittest. Or um, the other one sounds similar to uh, one we said earlier. Eat, drink, and party for tomorrow we die. This is all there is. So what are you going to do? If this is it, might as well live it up big because when you're dead, you're dead. That's kind of the philosophy of naturalism. Um, uh, then another newer one that I've been hearing in recent years, more, I'll say, by the Hollywood types, is they replace the name of God with the name universe. Well, the universe led me. The universe guided me. Well, I just feel like the universe is working for me right now. Have you heard any of that? I call it wacko talk. <laughs> it, it, I've heard some of that. Because what have you got if you don't have God? Well, it's the universe. Like the universe cares a rip about you. The universe doesn't give a rip about you. But we got to replace it with something that loves us. Otherwise, we're in this cold, heartless, unloving world as a naturalist. That's all you got. This is all there is. You drink a party for tomorrow, we die, and your soul's dead, and your fertilizer. Isn't that a wonderful life view? you? Well, that's powerful. Man, that's motivational. How many of you would rather your kid not grow up with that life view? You're going to have to do something about it. We're going to have to work on it. We're going to have to figure out. I'm going to give you four problems real quick, just so you understand this. Four problems with um, naturalism. The first one is the problem of morality. That problem is basically, um, basically says, I shouldn't get any credit for being good or bad because... 
Um, it's really just a chemical response to keep my species alive. We try to be nice to each other as humans to propagate our species, and that's really the only reason. It's just a chemical response. So it's not that we're good or we're bad. We're just being, um, doing the logical thing to, you know, whatever, keep our species alive. We're, we're no better or worse than a flower or, you know, a, any living, a tree or anything like that. And so morality kind of goes out the window for the naturalist. There's no real basis for morality. You could say, well, it is noble to take care of your own species. And you say, but don't you all think that like we're all gonna get wiped out by an asteroid eventually anyway? So, or, you know, like eventually, I'll say the second law of thermodynamics is gonna take over where everything just gradually drifts out into space and all the stars get cold and the planets get cold and the law of entropy takes over and everything devolves into disorder and chaos and disarray and it's just a cold, heartless, lifeless planet eventually. So eventually you're not keeping your species alive even if you're a good person as a naturalist. Eventually it all dies out in the end. So there's no real great basis for morality, but how many of you really believe that some things are actually right and some things are actually wrong? Show of hands, anyone here believe some things are actually right and some things are actually wrong? Okay, so it's not an actual way we can live, the moral issue. And then the second problem is the problem of self. If naturalism is true, then I do not exist as an individual self. I'm just a bundle of atoms bouncing around a much bigger bundle of atoms called Earth. In other words, there's nothing special about a big bundle of atoms like me. I'm the problem of self. You're, you're not really this individual. You're part of this connected atomic system, you know, with all your particles bouncing around all these other particles, and there's no real individual self. But how many of you, everyone poked yourself or pinched your leg or something. Real quick, are you there? Did you find yourself when you did that? So you do have a self, you are an individual, you know you're you. So it doesn't actually work. It's like, well, we could follow the philosophical naturalism all the way down the path, but it doesn't work when you follow it down the path. So you can just kind of step into it and say, I'll believe just enough about naturalism to say God doesn't exist and evolution and Big Bang and that's how it all came about. But I don't wanna follow the logical end of this belief because it ends with there's no self and there's no morality. And the third one is there's no free will. In naturalism, if you follow it all the way out, we choose to do nothing on our own. Everything we do or think is just a result of billions of years and trillions of atoms interacting, leading to this inevitable moment. It's not my fault, it's the universe's fault. How many of you don't want your kids coming home saying that next week? Punching a kid on the playground, it's not my fault, the universe made me do it. All the atoms, you know, moved around in their logical way until they hit this moment and where I punched. And it's not my fault. I couldn't have been any other way. The natural conclusion to naturalism is that everything is inevitable, that things are set on a course, and that based on the collision of all the atoms, um, you're just, you have no choice. How many of you chose to come here this morning? And how many of you were drugged here by your spouse? No, you don't have to say that. <laughs> You're here because you chose to, and so am I. We know that we're making choices, so naturalism doesn't actually function for me because I know I'm making choices. And so you can tell me that that's the philosophy of it, but it just doesn't actually work. Or the problem of purpose. Naturalism says there is no higher purpose, only personal survival and the continuing survival of our species. And uh, I, I just look at that and I'm like, I don't believe that. I've had a sense that there was a purpose for my life since I was a kid. I always felt like I was meant to be someone or do something or matter. And if you kind of felt like maybe you had a purpose and you were trying to, maybe you're still trying to figure it out, but there's a sense of it, right? Why is that sense of that there? Because it's real. Because God actually did make you for a purpose in life. 
And it is our goal to hopefully live that out through a life of obedience. Maybe you'll give us the big picture. Everyone's waiting for the big picture plan of what our purpose in life. So often we discover our purpose in life when we get to heaven and God looks back and says, you know how you were obedient that day and then that day and then that day and then that one and that one and that. And you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Guess what you did on all those days of obedience? You lived out your purpose. I wanted you to impact this person and this person and do this and this and this. I'm like, you mean I did my purpose? I was worried my whole life I didn't do my purpose. He said, every day of obedience was a day of lived out purpose. Wow, isn't that amazing? You were created on purpose and you were created for a purpose. So naturalism has a lot of problems when you follow philosophical naturalism all the way to its nth degree. It just doesn't work as a way to live life. And so I wanna do something real quick before we get into our, our biblical portion of the message here and uh, really start studying what God actually, his plan and the way he looks at creation. What I wanna do is take a moment for parents here, a parent's corner, and uh, encourage you with some things and being able to help your kids along this journey. I think for parents and for grandparents right now, as, grand, as a grandfather, I will be armed and dangerous with my grandkids when, when they come over. I'll be ready to help them understand that they were created on purpose and for a purpose. Amen? I'm going to be doing that. And so I want to take, take a look at one video. I want to tell you this. Everyone, uh, I want to give you a phrase here, intelligent design. Everyone say intelligent design. Okay, if you're struggling because your kid's coming home and there's all this stuff that they're learning um, about evolution or about the Big Bang or things like that, and it has no placement of God in the picture. They don't understand how God fits into the picture of this, of creation. And you're like, I don't know what to say to them. I don't know what to tell them. They tell me all this stuff. They're learning all this stuff. I looked at their homework, and I'm like, what in the world am I supposed to do? Because if they believe that, are they going to not believe in God anymore? The answer is most likely they're not going to believe in God. That is what is happening by the millions and millions annually with the younger group as they move out of high school. They are leaving the faith primarily because they are taught to be naturalists, which in inevitably leads away from a belief in God. So, what's the word I just told you to say? What is it? Intelligent design. Google that. Google intelligent design. You will find tons of great material for your children to begin watching. A lot of great stuff is designed for kids to watch. I've watched a ton of it on YouTube. I've sat down with my kids and watched this stuff over the years. I've read articles so I could explain uh, from an intelligent, educated, scientific perspective. But I, what, what I wanted to do is take about three minutes here before we get into our biblical portion. Three minutes here and take a look at what the, what scientists are saying related to intelligent design. God is our creator. Let's take a look at the screens for the next few minutes here and you'll see um, some support for this. As a scientist, scientist, microbiologist, biochemist, biochemist, as a geologist, neuroscientist, physician, biologist, and an engineer, I think there is overwhelming evidence for intelligent design in nature. I see intelligent design in the history of life. In the genetic code of life. In the molecular machines inside our cells. In the complexity of life. In the information embedded in living things. In the operation of the human brain. In the features of the human body. In the chicken and egg causal circularity of life. As a mathematician, I see great evidence of purpose in the universe. As a molecular biologist, I see evidence for design everywhere I look, pretty much. Nature is incomprehensible without inference to purpose and to intelligent design. The properties of the universe as a whole and our planet in particular were fine-tuned for our benefit and for our survival. In my view, the fossil evidence clearly points to its intelligent design. I see life as designed because when I look at life at the molecular level, I see exquisite engineering. All cells contain DNA, which include lots of information. 
and information is only the product of the mind. Darwin thought living cells were just blobs of jelly, but when I look in a living cell, I see evidence of factories, machines, uh, three-dimensional architectures, enormous amounts of encoded information. There's power generators, there's manufacturing plants. Life contains many features that we know from experience only arise from the activity of intelligent agents. The genetic code is like a software program. It's like somebody would have had to be a coder, would have had to form this particular genetic code. When I see that order and design, I have a really hard time believing that random mutation and natural selection, selection alone can cause uh, the complexity and the diversity we see in life. When you look at nature at large, what you see is incredible examples of innovation which surpass human technology. Examples include the flight capabilities of a hummingbird, sonar and bats, and greater innovation always implies greater intelligence from a designer. If you read the message from the molecules, it's really clear. They say clearly, intelligent design, intelligent design, intelligent design is the source of life. I love that. You can give a hand for that. Intelligent design is the source of life. God is the creator. There's no question of that for me. And uh, the probabilities, the mathematic probabilities of our universe existing as it does in a way that supports life. And by the way, I'm leaving this section of my sermon out because it was, I did it last service. Go listen, it was way too much material. I had to take it out. But I, and that, I have like tons of pages more that I've already cut out. But the point is, um, the probability for our universe to exist in a way that supports life is nil. It's just not there. It's not possible because of of all the forces of nature that are invisible forces that govern the creation are so extensive and so improbable that even one of them could exist, much less all of them could exist in a way that supports life, that any reasonable person would look at the logical implications of that and say, it, it cannot be. It cannot be unless someone decided that it should be. It would not happen on its own. There's a new theory out there which is called the multiverse or string theory that maybe if there were trillions of universes, one of them could exist like ours. That theory fails for the exact same reason the universe theory fails without God. The thing that would generate all the universes or the multiverse theory would be governed by a set of laws that were so specific that they could only happen if an intelligent designer made the multiverse generator as well. It fails on the same evidence that the universe fails on without there being an intelligent designer. There is a God who created the universe that we live in and there's no escape route from that reasonably or logically. I want you to understand that so that you don't feel like a dummy when you're telling your kids that God made it all. You're telling the reasonable, rational, well-researched truth. And you shouldn't feel ashamed of that. Amen? I want to encourage you on that. So what does the Bible teach us about creation? In Romans chapter 1 and verse 20, it tells us that his invisible, do we have that verse? Romans 1 verse 20, I'll read it here. It says, his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in things that have been made so that we are without excuse. It tells us a couple things that we're going to know. His eternal power and his divine nature are clearly seen. It first of all, it tells us that he's eternal. In other words, he existed before the Big Bang, or as I like to call it, the day God spoke the universe into existence. That's what happened there. It tells us that he was all power. He is his eternal power. He was powerful enough to speak universes into existence. How many of you know you don't get to speak a universe into existence unless you're kind of powerful? So he's eternal, he's before time began. He's powerful, he can speak a universe into existence, and he's God. 
his divine power, his divine nature. In other words, he still rules and has rights and authority over the universe that he created and over all the people that he placed in his universe. He remains divine and God and eternal over all that he has made. God says that we have no excuse. It says we have no excuse if we don't believe in him. And um, it basically just comes down to if you don't believe, it's not because nature doesn't prove it. It's because we're looking for an answer besides God. We don't want to believe in God. We want to find any other reason, any other thing that gets us away from that. By the way, if you read a lot of naturalistic authors, they don't just ignore Christianity. They have a specific animosity towards it. They're playing their cards and laying them on the table and saying, my studies are rooted in disproving this idea. In fact, Christopher Hitchens believed that Christianity was one of the great, he's one of the great atheist um, teachers of our time and naturalist, um, you know, uh, proponents. And he basically believed that Christianity was one of the greatest evils in the world. Oh my goodness. That says he has a slight slant to disprove the existence of God or to try, attempt to do that. In Psalms chapter 19, 1 through 4, it says, The heavens proclaim the glory of God, the skies display his craftsmanship. Day after day, they continue to speak, night after night, they make him known. They speak without a sound or a word. Their voice is never heard, yet their message has gone throughout the world and their words through all the world. He's, he's saying that creation is displaying, it's declaring, it's letting us know there's a God. It's begging us to research. It's begging us to study. It's begging us to put things under the microscope and try to understand the nature of the God who created it all, to understand his power and his creativity, to understand things like, I think God must have a sense of humor. I think that when I go to the zoo and I sit at the chimpanzee cage, I'm like, God must have a sense of humor. You ever seen a platypus? You're like, hey, let's just take uh, you know, this and that and the other and let's put them all together. Wouldn't that be funny? You know, I think there, someone had to have gotten a laugh in heaven the day the platypus was made. I, I look at it and I think there are so many things that we can look at and try to understand. Let me take a, a look at another verse. Colossians chapter 1, 16 and 17. It says, through him God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. How, many, how, mu how much did he create? And he did it through him. Does anyone guess, want to guess who him is? Jesus Christ. Through him, through Jesus, God created everything in heavenly realms, that means things that we can't see and can't study and can't put under a microscope. It's telling us right here, there will be things in nature that are unexplainable and things in the heavenlies that are unexplainable because they're created in the heavenly realm. But then there's the earthly realm. You can put a microscope on that stuff and check it out. He made the things that we can see and the things that we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, authorities in the unseen world. He's saying that they're actually spiritual rulership. We call that angels and demons that are in the unseen world. And then it says everything was created through him and what? So who were you created for? For Jesus, for God. And who were you created by? My God, you got it. He existed before anything else, before the Big Bang, before God spoke it into existence. They try to figure out what came before that moment of the Big Bang. Big Bang. Was there matter? Well, you know, technically, I guess there shouldn't have been matter. It, well, time, no, time didn't exist till that moment. Well, what about space? No, we don't even think space technically existed. So what could have made the moment? There's lots of theories. No one can figure it out. And God just says it. You want to understand the universe? Let me tell you how it worked. I appointed Jesus to rights to create everything in the unseen and the seen world. We existed before all of that, for all time, with all power, with all capacity to create everything that is seen and everything that is unseen. In other words, you don't get the half of it. You're only looking at one side of the picture right now. He existed before anything else and he holds all things together. 
Well, that's a fascinating statement to me. It means that Jesus is still actively involved in connecting his universe on a daily basis. There are four laws of nature that cannot be understood under a microscope. They can be the impact of the four laws is all that we can observe. The first one is the law of gravity. We can understand the impact of gravity. You ever understood the impact of gravity personally? We can understand the impact of gravity, but did you know that you can't put it under a microscope and look at gravity? It's an unseen force. Someone is holding the world together. Something is operating to hold all creation together. And gravity is one of the forces that holds it together. One of the other forces is the electromagnetic force, unseen, but the impact of it, it is seen. The other is uh, the strong nuclear force and then the weak nuclear force that are in the atom that help everything within the atom, all the parts of the atom to operate together. By the way, those forces are dialed in at very, very finite specific numbers. Numbers like one to, if you changed it by one in 10 to the 50th power, the weak force. One in 10 to the 50th power changed it by just one dot, way out at the 50th zero, if you switched it, everything in the universe would collapse in on itself. It just wouldn't work. And everything is dialed in to that specific number that works. And the Bible tells us in Colossians what those invisible forces of nature are. It's Jesus right now actively holding the universe he's spoken to existence together. Wow, wow, and the Bible doesn't explain anything. Before we knew there were forces that were holding the universe together, before the laws of nature had ever been discovered by scientists, the Bible is telling us it doesn't just get created. There have to be forces that are invisible that are actively holding all of the universe together in a present state right now. And that's what that passage in the Greek translated says, that he is in the active state of holding his universe together. It doesn't mean in the past he made it. It means in the past he made it and he actively is holding it together right now. And so I want our kids to understand this. I want our kids to get it. But there was more that God wanted us to understand, more that God wanted to reveal to us to be able to know who we were and how we'd created us and what he'd created us for. In Hebrews chapter one, this is what it tells us. It says, long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. I wanna stop right there for a moment. Many times and many ways, it meant God was just trying so hard to help humanity to know who he was, to understand God, to get it. And maybe he spoke to him in many ways, maybe through dreams and visions, through hardships and persecutions, through prophets, through his commands, and the, every, every which way, through creation. God is speaking to us. But in these last times, he has spoken to us through his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things through whom he also created what? The world. He said, but in these last days, he sent our creator to earth to connect with us personally. And while the naturalists sit in labs with microscopes trying to understand the purpose of life, God has sent his own son into the world so that the world could know the God who created them and know that they have purpose and know that they have meaning and know that their life is valuable. That will not be discovered under a microscope because that comes from the one who from the unseen world that is just as real, in fact, far more real. The unseen world of God is far more real than our world. It's the world that created our world. So which one is more real? How about is the picture you draw of Mickey Mouse on your bulletin more real or are you more real? It's you, you're the creator. 
The Creator's world is far more real, and He has stepped into our world to help us to know Him. A final passage I want to look at that's just so insightful. In John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, it says, In the beginning was the Word. I want to stop right here. It's interesting. It's God speaking about the Son, Jesus Christ. And as you read through the whole chapter of John chapter 1, it's, it, it transitions and it's talking about how the Word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten Son of God. It's no question who the Word is. The Word is Jesus Christ. But it uses the Greek word there, logos. In the beginning was the logos of God. The logos essentially means the divine expression. In the beginning was the divine expression of God and the divine expression of God was with God and the word and all things were made through him and without him was not anything made that was made. It's saying that there's nothing. Nothing was made without Jesus. The divine expression of God. Do you know what? It's also called it's also called Emmanuel, God with us. It says God came to be with us. The one who had spoken the worlds into existence, the one who holds it all together. What an interesting moment for Jesus when he was born of the Virgin Mary. To be like, wow, this is what it's like to be Adams. I spoke these Adams into existence and now part of me, not my divine nature, my divine nature still exists, but I'm walking around in the atoms I spoke into existence, and I'm actually holding my own body together in the ground that I walk on by the power of my will at every moment I am forcing the universe to remain connected to itself in an orderly fashion. You ever seen the movie The Matrix with Keanu Reeves? <laughs> I kind of picture that moment where it's like, I've entered the matrix. <laughs> I've stepped into this world that I spoke into existence. But he loved each one of us so much. He loved you so much that he was willing to come and walk among us, to walk in our flesh, the flesh he had spoken into existence, to walk on our planet, the one that he had spoken into existence and actively holds together each moment of our lives, to breathe in the oxygen, the atoms, the air that he had created so that we wouldn't have to search and look any longer. We would discover the God who made us on purpose for a purpose. And today, if your faith has wandered off a little ways from the God who created you, I want to assure you he's here right now loving you caring for you, wanting to restore you to the faith that you were created to know. I don't want you to think that you have to look anywhere else to find God. You don't have to look under a microscope. You don't have to look in a telescope. You don't have to look out into the universe. You have to look to the person of Jesus Christ. And that is where reality is ultimately found. That is where reality is found. And in this room, this reality still walks with us. He is still present. Now in the unseen world, but still more real than we are here. Still offering salvation and grace. His life was given as a sacrifice for the sin. The morals that we try to blow off and say, I don't have to live by morality. There's no God up there. No, your heart tells you different. That conviction you feel is the presence of the Holy Spirit at all moments walking with you. Even when you sin in the dark and no one sees you, God sees you and convicts you of that sin. He's the one thing you'll never escape. The conscience is not something mankind has put on us. It is what God has imposed on us. His moral code on our heart so that we have the opportunity to repent and to find Him and to be drawn to Him. And it's calling out to you today and warning you and saying judgment will come if you do not deal with this conscience and this shame and this guilt. Because on the day you die, your purpose will be lived out for all eternity with the God who created you if you believed on Jesus Christ and what he did, dying on the cross to pay for every sin, or your purpose will be eternally lost. 
you will never know what you were meant to know, who you were meant to be, and the one who created you if you do not make this decision now and in this life. So I want to pray with you. I want to give you the opportunity to believe that your creator God sent his own son, Jesus Christ, into the world to live a sinless life so that he could die on the cross and pay the price for every sin you ever committed. And that when you believe on what he did for you, you will be forgiven and saved from an eternal separation from God. So with every head bowed, would you pray with me? And online, will you pray with me? Heads bowed for our own moment with God. With every head bowed, if you're here and you'd say, today, I would like to receive Jesus Christ as my Savior and Lord. I would like to be forgiven of my sins. I'd like to become a follower of Jesus Christ with my life. Wherever you are, I'm not going to ask you to stand and come up, but in a moment, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand and say, Matt, pray with me. I'm giving my heart to Jesus Christ online. I want you to acknowledge that to Pastor Kira, who's online as our campus pastor. If you're here and you'd say, I'm giving my heart to Jesus Christ, would you put your hand up right now and say, I'm doing this. I'm giving my heart to Christ. Thank you. Others, hands up high. Thank you. Others, raise and over here. Absolutely, I'm praying with you. Others that are raising their hands back here. Others that are raising their hands, saying, this is my moment. I'm giving my heart to Christ. Now, all across the room, would you pray with me and support everyone that just raised their hand? Would you pray with me and support for them? Let's pray together, and I'm going to lead you in a prayer that I want you to pray if you're accepting Christ today and if you're supporting those who are. Let's pray together. Jesus, I know that I'm separated from you because of my sin. I ask you to forgive me. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I turned from my sins. I invite you to come into my heart. I want to trust and follow you as my Lord and Savior. Thank you for loving me and saving me. Amen and amen. Would you give a hand for everyone that just prayed with us today?